Hello, I am Peter Forsyth, a research engineer in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. This is a re-recording of a talk that I gave at our machine learning and finance reading group on defined contribution pension decumulation. Let's get started. So the talk is based on these three papers here. The first and last are finance papers, which survey the pension decumulation problem and its formulation. The second is a applied machine learning paper, which uses neural network techniques to attempt to solve the problem. Here's an outline of the talk. So the majority of the talk will be taken up by this first part here, in which I will give a general overview of the problem. Then at the end, we'll go on to the second part in which I discuss a paper applying machine learning techniques to this problem, the paper I just mentioned. Okay, so according to the Nobel Prize winning economist, William Sharp, um, this problem of defined, pension, defined contribution pension decumulation is the nastiest, hardest problem in finance. So in this introductory section, I will discuss what exactly is this problem that is so nasty and hard. Okay, so we'll begin with some background. Historically, in many countries, most employees had defined benefit pension plans. That is pension plans which at the point of retirement guaranteed to them a stream of payments until their death. However, now um, most employees in most countries have instead been shifted to defined contribution pension plans. So in a defined contribution pension plan, um, throughout their working life, an employee and their employer jointly contribute to a savings account. Then at the point of retirement, the employee is responsible for using the funds in the savings account to fund their retirement. So decisions about how much to withdraw and how to invest the savings are left up to the retiree. So in essence, the retiree assumes the risk. So given this background, the problem statement is then that a retiree over the course of their working life has accumulated savings. And now at the point of a retirement, they need to decide um, how much should they consume over time and how should they invest their savings over time? They make these decisions with the goals of maintaining consumption, that is maintaining their lifestyle, avoiding ruin, where ruin here is defined as running out of savings before death, and possibly of leaving a bequest, either to their heirs or to some cause that they fit. Now this problem of defined contribution pension decumulation can be viewed as the second half of the complete lifetime savings problem. So the first half of this problem is the accumulation of um, savings throughout a worker's working life. But for this purpose of this talk, we're only considering the second half of this problem. Okay, so in this pension decumulation problem, what are the risks faced by the retiree which they need to manage? Well, first of all, they face market risk. This is the risk that the investments into which um, the retiree has invested their savings do not perform well. And as a result, um, the value of their savings is degraded. They also face longevity risk. This is the risk that the retiree lives an unexpectedly long time and therefore may exhaust their savings before their death. They also face um, the risk of unexpected expenses. That is the risk that due to illness or some other cause, um, the retiree basically needs to meet um, a large expense, which may force them to draw down their savings more quickly than they had anticipated. Okay, 
So now um, let's discuss how we can analyze this problem through the lens of stochastic control. So stochastic control um, is a mathematical system that's suited for this kind of problem. And in general, in stochastic control, um, the way it works is, well, you have a decision maker and the decision maker makes decisions according to a control policy. So the control policy says that if you observe a certain state, then in response to that state, you should make a certain decision. And then, well, this decision in combination with some randomness from some external source affects the system and causes it to move to a new state. This new state is then observed and using the control policy, the decision maker then decides on a new decision. So this is sort of a very high level view of the stochastic control framework. And in general, in stochastic control, the idea is to choose the control policy to meet some objective that is to steer the system towards some desired state. Um, so that's, that's the framework we're gonna use to look at this problem of pension decumulation. Okay, so what happens when we apply the stochastic control lens to the pension decumulation problem? Well, first of all, the decision maker is the retiree. They're the one who decides on the control policy. And well, what is the decision that they make? Will they decide on asset allocation, that is into what they should invest their savings? And they also decide on consumption, that is how much of their savings should they consume over time? What are the sources of randomness? Well, the sources of randomness are market returns, that is how do their investments perform? And also mortality, that is when, do the, when does the retiree die? And lastly, what's the state of the system? Well, the state of the system consists of such things as the retiree's current wealth, the retiree's current age, and perhaps also some market factors upon which the retiree wishes to base their investment and consumption decisions. So this is how we can view the pension decumulation problem through the lens of stochastic control. Okay, so we were discussing what exactly is this, this problem we're talking about, this pension decumulation problem. But remember, at the very start, we said that William Sharp had said that this problem is the nastiest, hardest problem in finance. So let's think a bit about why this problem is so nasty and hard. So I think one of the reasons that this problem is so nasty and hard is the sheer scope of the uncertainty faced by the retiree. To illustrate the scope of this uncertainty, I've cooked up a simple sort of example simulation here. In this example, the retiree retires with $700,000. They invest 50% in a bond index and 50% in a stock index. They rebalance annually to maintain these proportions. Moreover, they consume $28,000 annually and they also receive some external funds from some government benefit stores, which they also consume. Now we assume that the retiree dies according to an inhomogeneous Poisson process. And to choose the rate of death in this Poisson process, I just looked at some Statistics Canada mortality tables. Moreover, we assume that the market um, follows the Black-Scholes assumptions and the parameters for the Black-Scholes equations, I just got them from a paper which calibrated them to some historical data. Okay, so these are, this is sort of the setup of our simulation. So let's see what is the result of this simulation. Okay, so here's the result. On the x-axis, we have the age of the retiree. On the y-axis, we have the wealth of the retiree. And each of the lines on this graph corresponds to a different possible path of the retiree's wealth over time, because of course the Black-Scholes model is a stochastic model. So if we run it again, we can get a different result. Note also that these lines are truncated at the point at which the retiree has died according to 
the inhomogeneous Poisson process. Okay, so the thing I want to get across here is the scope of the uncertainty faced by the retire. In these top two lines here, um, we can note that, well, the retirees' investments perform extremely well in these paths of the future. In fact, they perform so well that the retiree dies richer than they were at the point of retirement. So it may be that on these paths of the world, the retiree would, would regret um, not having consumed as much as they could have. Um, maybe they wish they had traveled the world. Um, then in the middle here, we have some paths of the future on which the retiree's wealth maintains relatively constant or declines slightly. Then on the bottom here, we have two paths in which the retiree's wealth actually reaches zero before their point of death. So in the terminology we defined earlier, we would say that the retiree has been ruined on these paths of the world. And so in these cases, the retiree probably regrets either their consumption or their investment decisions. So we can see that even though on all of these paths, the retiree is starting in the exact same circumstance and is following the exact same strategy, nevertheless, their fortunes vary vastly over these different paths. And I think this goes to show the sheer scope of the uncertainty faced by the retiree in the pension decumulation problem. And therefore, this is one of the reasons why this problem is so nasty and hard, as William Sharp said. Okay, let's proceed. So before, before going to the next section, I want to discuss annuitization, which is one possible solution to this nasty and hard problem. An annuity is a product which guarantees to its bearer a stream of payments for the remainder of their life. So in effect, if upon the point of retirement, um, a retiree spends all their savings on an annuity, they have effectively converted um, their defined contribution pension plan into a defined benefit pension plan. Now, according to some economic theory, this approach is optimal because it completely eliminates the, um, the longevity risk, which we were discussing earlier. The retiree no longer needs to worry about running out of savings because they're guaranteed a stream of payments until their death. However, um, in the real world, rates of purchasing annuities are extremely low and the annuity market is thin. So these, these authors here, McDonald et al., they survey a long list of reasons why this should be the case. Here are three reasons which stood out to me. First of all, they discuss adverse selection. So adverse selection is a phenomenon well known in economics. And the way it works is that, well, the demographics of the people who purchase annuities is, very, is significantly different from the demographics of the population as a whole, because the people who will benefit most from owning an annuity are the healthiest people, as they are expected to live longest and therefore receive the most payments from an annuity. So those are the people who will tend to buy annuities. But then observing the shifted demographics of their customers, a company selling annuities will need to raise the price of their annuities to cover their costs. But in raising their price, they will further shift the demographics of their customers. This can result in a vicious cycle, which leads to a market breakdown and may explain the relative thinness of the real world annuity market. Another possible explanation is the lack of inflation protection in most real world annuities. So most real world annuities guarantee a stream of nominal payments, not a stream of real payments. Therefore, the value of an annuity can be extremely degraded if you go through a period of high inflation like we're in right now. 
So this means that a real world annuity without an inflation protection is still strongly exposed to market risk and therefore is less desirable than it might otherwise seem. And the last reason is loss of liquidity. So if the retiree faces a sudden expense, then because they've spent all their money on that annuity, they don't have savings they can draw down to meet that expense. So together, these three reasons may explain why, well, the market for annuities in the real world is thin, rates of annuitization are low, and rates of annuitization are low. And therefore, they suggest that this problem is indeed nasty and hard that this theoretically optimal, easy solution of, of annuitization isn't actually a solution in the real world. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so we said that we were going to view the pension decumulation problem as a stochastic control problem. In any such problem, there needs to be an objective function, which you can use to judge which control policies are better and which control policies are worse. That is, you need some criteria according to which to judge control policies. So that's what we'll discuss in this section on objective functions. So yeah, the question is, how should we choose an objective function for this pension decumulation problem? Okay, the most classical approach is that of expected utility. And this here, this equation, is the um, objective function in the expected utility approach. So let's break it down. Um, so we have this first term here, and the most important part of this first term is this u of c here. So u, u is the utility function of consumption. So if you consume c dollars worth of consumer goods, U of C is the amount of satisfaction. You get U of C units of satisfaction from that consumption. Then this multiplier in front of U of C here is the discount factor. And it accounts for the fact that consumption in the future is less desirable than consumption now. Now note that we're summing our consumption from time t equals zero to time t equals big T where big T is the random time of the retiree's death. So then taken together, this first term is the total discounted expected utility from consumption that the retiree is going to get. Now we have the second term here, which is similar. We have V, this function V, which is the utility of bequest. So if the retiree um, leaves a bequest of size X, then knowing that they're going to do that gives them V of X units of satisfaction. And similarly, we have a discount factor here, just like we had over here. So then this whole sort of expected utility objective function says that, well, the amount of satisfaction a retiree gets from a control policy is, first of all, the total discounted expected utility of consumption combined with the expected utility of bequest. This is, as I said, a very classical approach from economics. It has deep roots in economic theory. One such root is this book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior by von Neumann, a famous polymath mathematician who worked on a wide variety of areas, probability analysis, numerical analysis, fundamental computer science, economics, and so on. And his collaborator, Morgan Stern, um, a well-known economist. So what are the advantages of the expected utility maximization approach? Well, I would say that the main advantage is its strong mathematical elegance. And this mathematical elegance lends itself to um, sort of elegant solutions to problems. So for example, um, Merton was able to find a closed form solution to a particular case of this problem when the objective function is stated as expected utility maximization. What are the disadvantages of this approach? Well, I would say that the primary disadvantage 
is that it's difficult to explain. That is, if you were to tell someone that um, you had come up with an optimal investment and consumption strategy, and you had done it sort of by analyzing the utility of consumption, um, I think to, to the uninitiated, this might be bewildering. And probably the reason it would be bewildering is that no one really knows what their utility function is. No one can say, how many units of satisfaction do I get from consuming C, C units of consumer goods, for example? And therefore, um, this can lead to sort of questionability of results derived from this objective function. So for example, if I pick a particular utility function for consumption, and then I get some results, but my results are contingent on that choice, then you might question the value of my results. You might say, well, um, given that, that no one can say what their utility function is, and we would have gotten a different result if we chose a different utility function, how can we apply this result? Because we, we don't know anyone's utility function. So I would say that in general, the problem with utility functions is that no one knows what they are, no one knows their own utility function, and it's sort of an unintuitive idea. Okay, so the second class is basically everything else. So I, I call it non-utility objective functions, and it includes all, utility, all sort of objective functions outside the expected utility um, objective function formulation of the problem. So I've listed two subclasses here. The first subclass is terminal wealth objectives. So in this subclass of objectives, we fix a sort of consumption strategy, and then we optimize only for investment. And then our objective function is a function of our final wealth. So the first terminal wealth objective is probability of ruin. So to solve a, a problem posed using the probability of ruin objective function, again, we fixed our consumption policy, and then we choose our investment policy to minimize probability of ruin, where probability of ruin is the odds that we run out of money before death. I think that the probability of ruin objective counters many of the disadvantages of the expected utility approach. Where the expected utility approach is unintuitive and difficult to communicate, I think that probability of ruin is very difficult to understand, even with people not familiar with the underlying financial theory. So you could say to someone, I recommend you follow this investment strategy. And they might ask why. And you would say, well, if you follow this investment strategy, then for the given consumption strategy, you will minimize your odds of running out of money before death. I think that's very clear and very easy to explain. The second terminal wealth objective is mean CVAR. So mean CVAR, like probability of ruin, it looks at your final wealth. But instead of just looking at the probability that you've run out of um, money before that time, it looks at, well, your mean final wealth and also some measure of your worst case final wealth or your left tail final wealth. So mean CVAR is richer than probability of ruin. It distinguishes much more than either I run out of money or they, I don't. But it's still, I would say, simpler and easy to communicate, easier to communicate than expected utility. So maybe it's somewhere between the simplicity of probability of ruin and the mathematical elegance of expected utility. Okay, so that was the probability, so that was the um, terminal wealth objectives. Um, a second subclass of non-utility function objective functions is the behavioral objectives. The first of these is habit formation. So in general, behavioral objectives are founded on the idea that we should be descriptive rather than prescriptive. That is, since we are formulating objective functions um, for a problem of human investment, we should therefore take known psychological facts about the way humans make decisions into account when building our objective function. So that's, for example, what habit formation does. In particular, habit formation takes into account the known fact that 
a significant proportion of a person's happiness depends not just on their absolute level of, of consumption, but also on the comparison of their current consumption with their recent levels of, of consumption, that is, with their consumption in the recent past. So therefore, the habit formation objective function will reward consumption that's higher than a baseline level of consumption, which is constituted by examining the recent past, and penalize consumption lower than this baseline level of consumption from the recent past. So then if you seek a control policy to maximize a habit formation objective function, we'll tend to strongly avoid consumption uh, strategies that may lead to sudden decreases in the level of consumption because the habit formation objective will penalize that. So that's one behavioral objective. Another is prospect theory, which I won't go into in detail, but in essence, the idea of prospect theory is to take into account certain empirical facts about the way people perceive risk, even if these facts may seem um, mathematically incorrect. So an example of such a fact is that there is a strong market for lottery tickets. So again, the idea of prospect theory is then to take into account sort of the psychological nature of how people perceive risk. Okay. So that was our section on objective functions. Now let's go back to our view of the problem as control theory. So we described our, our objective functions that we could choose from, but then when formulating our problem as stochastic control, we also need to consider um, what is the source of randomness? That is, what is the, the external sort of procedure by which we, we generate randomness to inject into the system? And in particular, in our case, we're going to be focused on random market returns. How should we generate these random market returns? And we're going to call this section market models. What are the models of market returns we can use? So I'm going to distinguish two classes of market models. The first class is classical models. So these are the stochastic differential equation models that are so ubiquitous in finance. The most basic classical model and sort of the core classical model is the Black-Scholes model in which there are two assets, a bond index and a stock index. The bond index is risk-free but has a low expected return. The stock index is risky but has a high expected return. Even though the Black-Scholes model is very simple, nevertheless, it's still capable of capturing some of the essential decisions the retiree needs to make. In particular, the retiree needs to decide under what conditions to accept more risk in exchange for more return and under what conditions to de-risk and um, accept a lower expected return in exchange for less risk. So this key decision is still captured by the Black-Scholes model, even though the Black-Scholes model is simple. There are additional extensions that can be added on top of the Black-Scholes model. So one class of extensions adds non-normal returns. So for example, we can have jump processes as illustrated on this graph on the right, according to which, um, well, the price of an asset can move very suddenly, much more suddenly than is possible in a Black-Scholes-like model, which is certainly realistic. We can also have stochastic volatility and autocorrelation which allow periods of high and low volatility in the market. In other words, volatility is not constant. And the retiree may wish to take into account these periods of high and low volatility when making their investment and consumption decisions. Another way to extend the Black-Scholes model is to add additional assets or additional stochastic factors to sort of increase the complexity and the richness of the model beyond the basic two asset case of the, the core model. Those were the classic mo models. Um, we also have the non-classical models. So these are sort of founded on this idea that, well, if we were gonna take a machine learning approach to this problem, then the natural thing to do would be in order to train our neural network control policy, we should just 
treated on a large amount of real data. However, that doesn't work in this problem because, well, think about it. The time scale of this problem of tension decumulation is years or decades. And the amount of real high quality stock market data is perhaps at most 100 years worth. So relative to the time scale of the decision, the time scale of the available data is short, too short to directly train a machine learning model. Instead, what we can do is generate synthetic data, which we will hope retain some of the essential properties of the real data. Now, there are various approaches to this, and this, in fact, was the topic of our reading group in the previous term. So examples of, of such approaches include bootstrap resampling, which amounts to slicing up real data and then shuffling the slices up and gluing them back together. But there are also sort of more machine learning generative model type approaches, such as VAEs and GANs. If you're interested in this topic of these non-classical market models, you can look at the slides on our reading group website from last term. Another important topic when um, modeling the um, pension decumulation problem is that of benefits and taxes. So these factors can be extremely important in the real world to solving this problem, and they can make a big difference. For example, a low wealth retiree um, may find it optimal to take on a bunch of market risk by investing their savings in a risky asset. If their gamble pays off, they've significantly increased their wealth, which they can use to fund their retirement. If the gamble does not pay off, then they may be able to fall back on government benefits as insurance. In contrast, a high wealth retiree may find it optimal to accept an otherwise suboptimal investment strategy because of the favorable tax treatment of that investment strategy. So in both cases, the optimal strategy by bo of both these retirees is shifted strongly by the presence of government benefits and taxes. So despite the importance of these factors in the real world, existing financial literature largely ignores them. And I think this is for two reasons. First of all, the rules for qualifying for government benefits or the, the tax code are both extremely complex and it's difficult even to write them down correctly. So to formulate this as a sequence of equations, as a system of, of equations, may be too much work and most researchers would prefer not to do it. Another reason existing financial literature ignores this is that even if, they, if you were able to, to state these tax and benefit rules um, as equations, well, finding the optimal control policy may be um, very difficult. Why? Because the function mapping to your post-tax income, it's at least going to be non-differentiable. And it may, in fact, be discontinuous in some cases, making optimization quite hard. OK. So um, well, we've discussed. Um, our view of this pension decumulation problem as a stochastic control problem. We discussed our objective function. We discussed the source of randomness. Now we need to discuss how do we choose our control policy. Okay, so I distinguish three levels of complexity, and I'll discuss what is the appropriate approach for each of these levels of complexity. So in the simplest case, for the, sort of the simplest formulations of this problem, it's sometimes possible to find closed form solutions for the optimal control policy, as Merton did. So when this is possible, this is the option that should definitely be taken with no question. However, in many cases, it's not possible. So that moves us to the second case here, where we've added some additional complexity on top of the very simple version of the, the problem we see in this first case. So we can add sort of more complex market models or more complex rules about how trading works. 
in these cases, we can't find a closed form solution, but nevertheless, we can formulate the problem as a dynamic programming problem, and then convert this into a Hamilton Jacobi Bellman PDE, and then use a numerical PDE solver to find a solution. So this is a reliable method to solve the problem, even when we can't find a closed form solution. Now, there's a third level of complexity. In this third level of complexity, maybe we have so many assets or so many stochastic factors that a numerical solver would just break down. Or maybe we're even using one of these non-classical market, market models. In these cases, it's not possible to use this numerical solver approach. So the idea that's been proposed in a few papers is that instead we should represent the control policy as a neural network and then optimize to find the weights of that neural network. Okay, so these are three approaches for finding control policies in three different levels of complexity. Okay, so that was the end of my first section of this talk in which I gave a broad overview of the pension decumulation problem viewed through the lens of stochastic control. Now in this final short section, I'm going to discuss this paper here, which um, discusses an application of machine learning methods to the pension decumulation problem. So it's called Deep Neural Network for Optimal Retirement Consumption in Defined Contribution Pension System. So the authors are from Australia and their work is motivated by the fact that Australia transitioned to a defined contribution system significantly earlier than many countries and so its system is much more mature. So the way they formulate this problem, they actually fix the investment strategy of the retiree and solve for the consumption strategy. Um, so they assume that the retiree has invested their wealth in some mutual fund. And so the retiree no longer makes any investment decisions. They add to their model realistic market dynamics and certain features of the Australian social security system. What's their objective function? Well, their objective function is this constant relative risk aversion utility function. So this parameter rho here determines the degree of risk aversion. So large rho corresponds to high risk aversion, whereas rho close to zero corresponds to almost risk neutral. This u of c then is their utility of consumption. They also have v of w, which is the utility of bequest, um, as we mentioned earlier. And in their utility of bequest function, they have this parameter phi, which determines the extent of the bequest motive. So phi at zero corresponds to no bequest motive. In other words, the retiree doesn't care about leaving bequest. And phi close to one corresponds to a high bequest motive. All right, so what do they use as their market model? Well, they use what they call an economic scenario generator, which resembles a classical financial model of the market, but which has many more assets and many more stochastic factors than you would normally see in a traditional um, financial model. So for example, this model includes a model of inflation, short-term interest rates, equity returns, international equity returns, bond prices, domestic and international, and also uh, house prices. So this model has a whole bunch of parameters. They get them by calibrating this model to his, some historical data. And the role of the model, well, they use it to determine the performance of the retiree's investment portfolio. Also, they use it to calculate the degree to which the retiree is eligible for social security benefits. And they also use this inflation factor here to calculate the purchasing power of the retiree's consumption spending. Okay, and I mentioned earlier that one of the interesting things about this paper is that unlike most financial papers, they attempt to model um, government benefits. So in particular, they model the Australian age pension system, which um, guarantees some payments to Australian retirees as a function of their wealth and the inflation level. 
Okay, so what's their approach for finding the control policy? Well, as I said, in this paper, the control policy is represented as a neural network. And it's a neural network whose only output is consumption, remember, because investment is fixed. So the inputs are, what is the state of the market? What is the age? What is, what is my wealth? And the output is, how much should I consume this period? So then how they find the optimal control policy is, well, they use this, this function here. So basically, they simulate some number of paths of the market using their economic scenario generator, call that number M. And then on each pass of the market, so ZM is the mth path of the market, they compute U of ZM beta. So U tells you what is the realized utility on that ZM path of the market. When you use the control function, um, where the control function is determined by the weights of the neural network, and those are stored in this vector beta. So then utility is a function of how did the market play out? And also what is my control policy according to my neural network weights? So then they just compute this utility on each of these realized paths of the market that they've simulated. And then they use stochastic gradient descent to optimize beta. In other words, to find the weights that give them the best control policy on this path of the market. So that's their optimization approach for finding the optimal control policy. A note here is that um, unlike some other papers, the authors of this paper, they don't take a dynamic programming approach. That is, they never write down any Bellman equation and never solve for a value function. So this is in contrast to certain reinforcement learning approaches, which take neural networks both to model the control, but also to model the value function. Here, there's no Bellman equation and the neural network only models the control policy. It, there's no neural network modeling the value function, which I thought was an interesting difference. And the authors themselves call this out and argue that this much simpler approach is beneficial given the relative simplicity of the problem compared to some other problems to which reinforcement learning is traditionally applied. Okay, so what are their results? Well, they, they do a number of analyses. So in this plot here, they show on the x-axis the number of iterations of training, and the y-axis, the, the amount of times in 100,000 test pass of the market, the, the amount of time that the learned control policy outperforms each of these six baseline policies. Each of these policies corresponds to some sort of formulaic strategy or rule that they got from the literature. So they're comparing their sort of dynamic learn strategy with these non-dynamic fixed strategies. And perhaps, as you might expect, as the training goes on, their performance improves. And eventually, basically 100% of the time, they're outperforming all of these baseline strategies, as you might expect. And I guess the reason you might expect that is because, of course, this control policy is trained, whereas the others aren't. Now, a question I had, which I've written here, is what would be the effect of changing the economic scenario generator parameters? Uh, so for example, if we trained on an economic scenario generator with one parameter, one set of parameters, and then evaluated using an economic scenario generator with a different set of parameters, would the performance be similarly good? Um, that might be a better out of sample test, and I think necessary given the uncertainty about the, the movement of the market in the future and whether it will resemble the past. Okay, here's another analysis they do. So on the x-axis, we have retirees' age. And on the two y-axis, we have retirees' wealth and retirees' consumption level. And here they look at the, the effect of this parameter rho. So remember back here, um, rho determines the degree of risk aversion. So then they're seeing how this affects retiree wealth and consumption. And as you might expect, if you increase risk aversion, well, consumption becomes more smooth, more flat. That is. Well, and, and I should, by the way, mention that this wealth and consumption in this plot, it's a median over many paths. It's not just one path. Okay, so as I was saying, for higher risk aversion, consumption is more smooth. That is, you consume less at the beginning of your retirement in order to be able to consume more at the end of your retirement. In contrast, for low risk aversion, um, this is not the case. And in fact, you consume a lot at the start of your your retirement and then rapidly draw down over time. So this is just confirming that 
the strategies are doing something sensible in response to changing the risk aversion parameter. Um, they also look at what is the effect of different wealth. So here again, we have the same kind of plot, age, median consumption, median wealth. And they look at what is the effect of the initial wealth on the, on the strategy. And they note that as you would expect, um, well, consumption declines as you increase, as you uh, decrease initial wealth. So if, as we go from say 100,000 initial wealth to 300, sorry, a million initial wealth to 300,000, our consumption declines. However, the consumption decline is not proportionate. And the others state that this is a consequence of the learned control policy using the fact that there is a pension system. So, sorry, a government benefit system. So the control policy knows it can rely on the government benefit system. So it doesn't need to decrease its consumption in response to um, decreasing wealth as much as it otherwise would need to. Okay, here's my sort of summary of this paper. Well, I think the interesting aspects of this paper, as I pointed out, were they have a sort of an unusually complex model of the market and an unusual, uh, and, and they are an unusual and they include a model of social security, which is uncommon. I mean, they use neural, a neural network to sort of get around any difficulty they might have in optimizing in this case. But I would have liked to see, uh, as I said, more perturbation analysis. So how do you perform if you perturb the parameters of the economic scenario generator? And also they looked at sort of median consumption wealth along of their strategy, but I would look, like to see more about the distribution, um, how wide or narrow is the spread of consumption and wealth this, this strategy that learned produces. And I'd also like to see how exactly do market variables affect the policy? How does the, the learned policy take observations of market variables into account when deciding on consumption? This is my final slide. So you might ask, what is the role of machine learning in this financial problem of defined contribution, pension decumulation. Well, I would say that the main role is to um, solve formulations of this problem that are more complex than could previously be handled with other methods. Um, so perhaps, perhaps you can add, as, as was in this, this paper, more complex models of the market or sort of realistic models of taxes and social security. However, in modeling, there's always a trade-off between parsimony and completeness. So it's risky to have an overly complex model because then it becomes difficult to anal analyze. So um, there's usually a sweet spot between parsimony and complexity. So I would say that the best use case of ML is not to enable us to do extreme, to analyze extremely complicated models with tons of bells and whistles, but to solve problems that are beyond the limits of conventional techniques, but not excessively far beyond. That's my guess, at least, that the role of machine learning techniques in solving this kind of problem. Okay, thanks, thanks for listening to my talk. <laughs>